Joining us now to give us their perspectives from Albany, New York, former DEA agent Michael Levine. He spent more than 25 years as an undercover operative in the organization and believes the U.S. war on drugs has failed. With us from Denver, Kevin Sabat, who served under President Obama as senior advisor at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Kevin is also author of the book, Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. Kevin, why don't I start with you? Um, a lot of people really beginning to question the war on drugs. A trillion dollars spent, uh, they're locking up people every day. Doesn't seem to be making much of a dent in the drug trade. We're seeing so many people slaughtered in Mexico. Why do you still believe in this uh, war on drugs? Well, actually, I don't believe in that term at all, or nor even the term prohibition. A, a war term and war analogy is a really poor way to describe something that really is a public health issue first and foremost. So let's be very clear. I would actually don't hear anybody except for people in favor of legalization talking about a war on drugs. So let's be clear about our terminology. I think what you mean, though, to talk about is really the issue about whether what we're doing, prevention, treatment, enforcement, whether it works. And the bottom line is drug use is actually much lower today than it was in the late 1970s. Yes, we have new threats, but we've actually have made some progress. I mean, cocaine use is at a historic low uh, in the last 15 years, just this, this past year. Production worldwide is way down. Um, we are seeing a resurgence of prescription drug abuse, which is actually, I would argue, the fastest and the number one drug problem today. It's killing more people every day than cocaine or heroin ever did in their heyday. It's also the number one um, accidental poison death is because of prescription drugs. But let's look at that for a minute. Those drugs are legal, available, and, um, and pretty widespread. They do not offer a model, nor does alcohol or tobacco, for our current illegal drugs. That doesn't mean we should lock people up, that people People need to have criminal records. I'm in favor of expungement. I'm in favor of making sure that once people serve their time, they can vote and become actually integrated members of society. So I think the way that this debate has been set up, prohibition on one hand or incarceration versus legalization slash regulation is a really poor way that char unfortunately characterizes our current debate in this issue. Um, the real answers lie with public health. They lie with treatment, they okay, lie well, with early intervention. Kevin, let me, let me yeah. just interrupt for just a second to give Michael sure. a chance to, to jump in here because he was one of the guys, uh, sure. boots on the ground, so to speak. So Michael, what, what's your assessment of what Kevin just said? Well, basically, sadly, uh, it's the same thing I've been hearing for four decades. Uh, it, bottom line is, let's keep doing what we're doing. Einstein defined no. uh, dumbness or insanity as doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And that's what we've been doing since so-called war was declared on drugs. Fact is that I wrote a book called Fight Back that was recommended by the Clinton administration, and it focused the whole force of... Uh, the, the war on drugs, the prevention, the rehabilitation, into the hands of the, each community. It actually, we, we, uh, it's in the book, we worked it, we actually showed that it was 100% effective in cutting down drug trafficking, mm -hmm. drug crime, sure. and all related issues, mm -hmm. and yet uh, it was ignored, even though recommended by the Clinton administration. And in the book, I detail how there are vested interests big monetary interests that rely on the continuation of a high budget so-called war on drugs whatever you call it well the budget is immense yeah. uh, and it's let's the same story clear. over and over and over yeah right uh, well, let's I, be very you know clear. I'm, I'm, I'm a policeman in, right well go ahead Kevin what were you gonna say well, I'm actually in agreement with what your uh, with what the interview was saying about the need for community investments in prevention and treatment. So that we wouldn't disagree. But I'm not arguing to do the same thing over and over again. We've well, never, but, but as Kevin, your but uh, Kevin. interviewer just said, we've never invested in prevention the way we have that we should. It's a crime that 10% of people who need treatment get it. We can actually do that. I'm definitely not a shell for for-profit prison industries. I think that they're an abomination. And the, if those are the money interests we're talking about, um, the other interviewer and I are. On on the same side but actually when you look at money on drug policy these days we're on the brink of creating the new tobacco industry sure. that's going to be called the marijuana industry if people don't think this is about money and legalization for the big corporate interests that stand to gain with legal marijuana we have another thing coming for us and we're going to suffer the exact same way we've suffered with big tobacco and frankly the liquor lobby I, for the last 50 I, years I, michael i think you're leaving out i think you're leaving out the really big interests uh, who okay. have monstrous budgets 
dependent on a war on drugs. These are people who equip police departments. They're, when I started in the so-called war on drugs, there were three agencies enforcing the law. Uh, it was DEA, Customs Hard Narcotics, and in general, certain police agencies. The budget was something like 40 or 50 million dollars. Now, uh, there is something like 53 federal and military agents. Uh, every every state has. Well, that's also because the nature of the drug problem. Is, you know, yeah. Well, yeah, the nature yep, of the drug problem. Yeah, that's if you change philosophy. Forty years ago. You know, for for um, example, in, in for example, in one community where we got the community sure. out there, similar to the way we attacked the John laws. Uh, we put them on the streets, drug-ridden community, all kinds of related crimes. And first thing that happened was the minute we got the community following these tactics and fight back, uh, drug crimes, drug trafficking disappeared. Right. There are over 6,000 community coalitions uh, around the country, drug-free community coalitions. You can lo look it up. CADCA is their trade group. They actually are the ones that get the yeah, clergy, yes, but they're depending the, the businesses. On, they're depending on police. No, no, they're not. They're, these the are prevention they're people. These are guys that, no, sir, I'm sorry. I, I think it's a bit outdated, your point of view. I hate to say it. They're not depending on police. That Police is one of 12 sectors. Um, they're, they're actually depending like, on how youth. Is they're depending on how prevention. is yesterday outdated? No, what, what <laughs> I'm saying is they're not depending uh, on Kevin, police. Uh, Kevin, Michael, I think, we're, you're nothing, I think we're, we're kind of getting in the weeds here. <laughs> Let me ask uh, Michael this <laughs> question because I know you were undercover. Uh, what, talk to me about Mexico. What is the, the effect on the neighboring country of Mexico with uh, illegal drugs. Well, here's in the a States. major problem. Yeah, a major problem that we're not even talking about uh, is that there are interests in our government that are protecting the drug flow and not telling America. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote deep cover uh, about one such case went into Mexico. We were able, we were able to corrupt the top of the Mexican government, get them involved in a in a major 15-ton drug deal, and. Our case was sabotaged by our own Department of uh, State, Department of Justice, because at that particular time, North American Free Trade Agreement was on the boards. And if undercover agents could tell the American public that we were being promised a wide open Mexico by the then incoming president of Mexico, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, who was also bringing in yeah. NAFTA, um that that uh, it would never pass it would just simply never yeah. pass the 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 book well, I mean, was voted uh, one of yeah. the most censored by mainstream media right. books well and i don't what yeah. can i tell you i don't I'm, deny I, yeah yeah, I'm not here to defend that. I have no details that of the case. Goes, my issue but is, Kevin, I let me ask you about that. What about, what about That's the pressures the on? It what continues. about the pressures on government and and what he's yeah. talking about? Politicians who run. I'm going to be tough on drugs. Um, it, it's a broken yeah. system. Well, How do you repair reform it? Yeah. Given these I, uh, dynamics, I think we need to be. Right. I think we need to be smart on drugs, not tough or soft. And again, I haven't heard that rhetoric for 15 years, tough on drugs. It's about being smart. We have proven strategies that, that work. And actually, I would be in I am in complete agreement with Michael in terms of what those strategies are. They're community-based strategies. When it comes to Mexico, though, what's often being touted legalization, for example, as an answer to their problems is ridiculous when you actually look at the deep-seated institutional issues that need to be taken care of in a country like Mexico, let alone the United States, which I think is, again, what Michael's referring to. But in Mexico, things like if you don't have a functional um, law enforcement, judicial um, health system, education system, social service system, you know, good luck trying to rid the community of those things. In fact, the drug trafficking organizations are not really trafficking just in drugs anymore. It's about human trafficking. It's kidnapping. It's extortion. Well, the dynamic has changed Im Im immeasurably for the last 10 years. So, I, by the way, I have to do my book plug here uh, since uh, Michael got about three in, um, is that the issue quick. is people think it's about legalization. Uh, my recent <laughs> book is coming out called Reef Sanity, um, goes through the seven great myths about marijuana, um, which uh, I think have been unfortunately put out as an answer to Mexico. These are deep-seated problems that do require community. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we're just about out of time. I do have to ask you if the United States could uh, legalize alcohol, why not marijuana? And I'll start with you, Michael. Make it quick. Uh, I'll go back to the Bush administration. Did a survey of kids who in these horrific ghettos who stayed off of all drugs, and the reason was in 90% of the cases, drugs are illegal. I grew up in the South Bronx. My brother was a heroin addict. The fact that drugs were illegal kept me off drugs. I don't want to sell those kids down the river. Kevin? 
Well, I couldn't agree more. I think he said it perfectly. And frankly, alcohol, unlike marijuana and other drugs, has had a long, widespread history of our culture trying to erase it with prohibition. Over 55% of Americans regularly drink, 7% of Americans regularly smoke marijuana. And frankly, alcohol is not exactly the best example of a policy. We have 10 to 1 ratio in terms of cost to taxes. Every dollar in revenue, we spend 10 in social costs. It's not a model for anything. Kevin, Michael, you both brought your book plugs and uh, some heat. Thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.